I trust you are aware that we're being controlled in every area of our lives, even the toothbrush that you will use tonight to brush your teeth with. Otherwise, what you're going to hear for the next few moments' time could be very disturbing to you. So, here are the facts. There is as much crude oil on the north slope of Alaska as there is in Saudi Arabia. The governor of Alaska stated on the Mill Mayor TV show, Real Time, on March the 18th, 2005, there is potentially enough crude oil on the north slope of Alaska to supply the entire United States of America for 200 years. He's correct. Peak oil is a misnomer. It is an idea perpetrated by the powers that be for the purpose of deceiving the American public. Russia has just drilled some what they call super deep wells to the depth of 40,230 feet. Super deep wells, which they call Cola SG3, they have found massive amounts of oil. The world is nowhere near running out of crude oil. Gasoline at the gas pump could be less than $1.50 a gallon within the next one year here in the United States of America if only our president and vice president and our administration in Washington would be honest with the American people. There is enough natural gas on the north slope of Alaska to supply the entire United States of America for over 200 years if every other natural gas well in America were cut off tomorrow morning at the projected rate of increased consumption every 24 hours at Prudhoe Bay, Alaska on the north slope where the large oil field is, they pump back into the ground one billion cubic feet of natural gas that comes up with the oil. You did hear correctly. I did not say million. I said one billion cubic feet. And just in case you would like some details and would wish to follow further with what I'm saying to attempt to prove right or wrong, try this one. Contact someone you know that works on the North Slope of Alaska, anyone that has any contact with anyone there, and ask them this. They are using 48 747 type jet aircraft engines in order to pump that eight, uh, a one billion cubic feet of natural gas back into the ground every 24 hours. If you want details, we can go as far as you'd like. Dr. Stan Monteith, you know who I'm speaking of, don't you? Very famous radio talk show host, very conservative individual. I've been on his station, on his program many times in the past year. Dr. Stan said to me a while back, he said, Lindsay, I like to prove what I have on my show. He said, can you in some way verify the information that you're giving in your book, The Energy Non-Crisis, and the other things that you have to say? And I said, well, Dr. Stan, for you, knowing who you are, and the fact that you will not tell faults about what you hear, I say, yes. I will give you the name of an individual who right now is working for BP Oil Company. As you remember, BP bought out Arco, and BP and Arco were basically the ones that produced the entire Prudhoe Bay oil field, east and west side, Arco on the east side, BP on the west side. And I said, I will give you the name of an individual who still works there that was back there during the days when I was there that saw the Gull Island field brought in and proven Dr. Stan Monteith took his phone number. I will not give his name for protection because this man has said, if you can ever get a congressman who will make a congressional investigation out of this, he said, I will appear, even though it might cost me my life and my family. So I said, Dr. Stan, I'm sure you'll keep it there, and therefore I won't give his name tonight. But Dr. Stan called him, found out he does work for BP, verified who he was, and his question was, is what Lindsey Williams says in his book, The Energy Non-Crisis, true? The gentleman said, yes, everything he says is true in fact, but he said he hasn't told what I know since he left. 
And Dr. Stan said, what's that? He said, since Lindsay left the Prudhoe Bay oil field as chaplain, we since have discovered another field as large as Gull Island. America has everything we need on the north slope of Alaska. My book, The Energy Non-Crisis, is the only book on the face of the earth that tells of the largest oil pool in North America, possibly the largest oil pool on the face of the earth, that was discovered, brought in, tested, and proven when I was there as a chaplain. And today, not one drop of that oil has ever been allowed to come to the American people by order of the government of the United States of America. Gasoline, within 12 months' time, could be at the gas pump in California less than $1.50 a gallon if only the administration in Washington would be honest with us as American people. I'll never forget that day. I had just gone to Alaska as a missionary. It was 1970. Came out in the Anchorage newspaper, Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline to be built. 25,000 pipeliners to converge on the state of Alaska to build that 800-mile pipeline, four-foot diameter, largest pipe ever constructed on the face of the earth for carrying of crude oil, $12 billion to be spent in three years' time, 25,000 pipeliners to converge on the state of Alaska. The first thing that came to my mind was, as a Baptist missionary, 25,000 of the most cussingest, drinkingest, onerous folks on the face of the earth. <laughs> and believe you me, that was the understatement of the year when I arrived on the pipeline. So I went to Alaska Pipeline Service Company and I said, don't you need a chaplain on the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline? They said, well, we never had a chaplain on any pipeline in the world. We wouldn't know what to do with you. They said, come back and see us later. Well, I did. I guess persistence paid off. Because after a number of months, they finally said, all right, we'll let you have the northern seven camps, including the big oil field at Prudhoe Bay, down to Galbraith Lake in the Brooks Mountains, and go up there and see what you can do. Just hold a worship service in each one of the camps once a day. said, the men don't know the difference. After all, they worked six weeks on, six weeks off, seven, uh, uh, 12 hours on, 12 hours off. They don't know what Sunday is, and I did. About six months later, Mr. R.H. King, I'll never forget him, Mr. R.H. King came to me, he was a personal relations man with Alaska, and he said, Chaplain, we never knew what value you would be to us. He said, you're literally saving us thousands of dollars of counseling fees that we aren't having to pay, and we have just voted to give you executive status if you will accept it. And I said, well, Mr. King, what does that mean? I've never been an executive on anybody's board but the Lord's. And I said, well, what? He said, well, you can go any place you'd like, see anything you'd like to see. We'll let you have your own vehicle, have, give you an executive pass. And he said, we would like to invite you to sit in on our board meetings in an advisory capacity in order to help the relationship between management and labor. For the next three years' time, only by the providence of God, because it never could have been any other way, I had the opportunity to sit with, live in the same dorms with, rub shoulders with, sit across the table from the most powerful, controlling, manipulative men on the face of this earth. The ones that you only read about in books. It changed my life. I never knew such people existed. I'd been a Baptist minister for 20 years. I had had the privilege of being around honest people and deacons and good Christians. And all of a sudden, I was thrown into the midst of those that you hear that control the world. If someone had asked me in 1970, Lindsay Williams, do you believe there's a group of people on the face of the earth who control the world? I would have said, not only do I believe it, I, I would have said in 1970, I, said, I would have said, who are you, a John Bircher? If someone had asked me in 1980, Lindsay Williams, do you believe there's a group of people on the face of the earth who tell the president what to do, who tell the Arabs what they're going to give them for a barrel of oil, 
who dictate to the world what they should do, I would have said, not only do I believe it, I sat and listened to them talk about it. For three years' time, strictly by the problem, here, here I was, an unknown little aviation missionary. Nobody knew who Lindsey Williams was. Back out in the bush country of Alaska, and all of a sudden had an opportunity to sit with the people that you only read about. I remember one night, I'd been around them all day long. I couldn't believe there were such human beings on the face of the earth. I remember I went back to my dorm room, utterly exasperated at what I had seen and heard that day. I, I laid down on my bed in utter frustration, looked up at the ceiling and literally cried out to God. And I said, God, how can there be such dastardly people on the face of the earth that literally control the world? Folks, there are people who control the world. They have an agenda. They know what they are doing. How do I know? I was there. I lived with them for three years' time. I sat in their board meetings and heard what they had to say. My book, The Energy Non-Crisis, and I've written six books, by the way. have two of them here with me tonight. My books, all of them, including this one, my first one, The Energy and On Crisis, are different than any other books you'll ever read. The reason they're different is because I did not research someone else's materials in order to write these books. These books are what I lived. First-hand stories of the people that I rubbed shoulders with. Ones that I knew them by first name, and I was considered to be their chaplain and minister. The power controllers of the world, and I write from first-hand experience, I lived my story. Well, finally, after about two years of this, I decided no one's ever going to believe a little missionary like me. If I ever decide to tell this story, no one would pay any attention to it. After all, how do they know I'm telling the truth? So I contacted a gentleman of great prestige, a man that I knew anyone would trust what he had to say. He writes the foreword to my book, The Energy Non Crisis. His name is Senator Hugh Chance from the state of Colorado. And I said, Hugh, I'd like you to come to Prudhoe Bay and spend a week with me. I'll make all the arrangements with the oil company officials for you to see, talk with, have interviews with, anyone you'd like. He took me up on my offer. I made all the arrangements. He came to Prudhoe Bay. He spent one week with me. He interviewed every oil company official he wanted, from the senior executive with Atlantic Richfield down to BP oil company officials, and anyone that he wanted to talk with. They gladly gave him an interview. I will never forget what he said the day before he left. He said, Lindsay, you'll find it recorded, by the way, in my book, The Energy Non Crisis. Senator Hugh Chance. I had to have a reputable person to see what I was seeing, or how would the world ever believe what I was going to say? He said, Lindsay, I was sitting in the Senate of the state of Colorado when the men came from Washington, D.C. to brief us as state senators as to the energy crisis. He said, Lindsay, from what I have seen here this week, from the mock-ups of the field, from the documentation, from the people I've talked with, I've come to realize that almost everything that I was told in that top-level briefing in the Senate of Colorado by the men from Washington, D.C., that almost everything I was told was the exact opposite of what the truth really is. He said, I was intentionally misbriefed, and I was lied to. Later, when I wrote the manuscript to my book, The Energy Non Crisis, I asked him to write the foreword to the book. He did. You'll find it recorded here with his name on it. I'll never forget that day. It was 1976. I walked over to Arco Base Camp one morning, and as I walked in the front door, there was standing a gentleman by the name of Jim Lawler. He was the equipments man for Atlantic Richfield. And I said, Jim, what's going on today? He said, well, chaplain, would you like to really see something exciting? I said, well, Jim, I'm always in for excitement. What do you mean? He said, come on, 
hop in the pickup truck and let's go out to West Dock. He said, I'd like, to see, I'd like you to see what we think we have struck today. And I said, Jim, what's that? And as we rode along, he tried to explain that little island out in the Arctic Ocean, about two, two and a half miles out from the west dock at Prudhoe Bay where the big flotilla came in every year. He said, Chaplain, we think we have just struck the largest pool of oil in North America and maybe the largest pool of oil in the world. Today we're going to release some oil, check the chemical analysis, the pressure of the field. We already know the size of the field. And he said the depth, and he went on to explain all the technical details that an oil man could. And when we arrived at the west dock, we sat there for a few moments, and all of a sudden, a big black plume of smoke went up into the sky. That was back in the days when they still let them burn it off at Prudhoe. And after he watched it for a few moments, he said, Come on, chaplain, get in the truck. we got to head back to Arco Base. I want to see what's coming in from out at the well site. I'll never forget that day. And when you hear, as Paul Harvey says, the rest of the story, you'll know why gasoline could be a dollar and fifty cents a gallon at the gas pump within one year's time if only administration in Washington, D.C. would be willing to tell the American people the truth. We arrive back at base camp. Standing around the desk in Mr. Ken Fromm's office on the second floor of Arco Base was the top eight oil company men of the world. I arrived with Jim Lawler at the door, and Ken Fromm, senior executive with Atlantic Richfield, said to me, come on in, chaplain, and they closed the door. And there I stood that day with men that I never knew I'd rub shoulders with. Here I am, a simple missionary, aviation missionary out in the bush of Alaska, and all of a sudden, I'm standing in the room watching the proof of the largest oil pool in North America and probably the largest oil pool in the world. Approximately, if I remember correctly, eight men standing around that table looking at the mock-up of the field, looking at the perforations of the pipe, explaining all the details. I was invited in the room, and Mr. Ken Fromm, after a few moments of excitement, and I have never seen such excited oil men in all my life. They were almost beside themselves. And finally, Ken Fromm looked over at me, and he said, Chaplain, we have just done it. I said, Ken, you've just done what? He said, we have just done struck the largest pool of oil in North America. It should be headlines on every newspaper in America tomorrow morning. America energy independent. We don't need any more foreign oil. We can supply from our own soil. He said we have everything we need. He said, Chaplain, this is the most amazing find we've ever discovered in America. You can imagine that night I went back to my dorm room First thing I wanted to do the next morning was get up and see the headlines on the Anchorage newspaper that came in on Wien Airlines' first flight to Prudhoe Bay. I rushed back over to Arco Base that morning to have breakfast, and I'd hardly walked in the door good, and the security guard caught me and said, Chaplain, don't you say a word to anybody. You go right straight upstairs and sit down in Mr. Ken Fromm's office. I said, well, what have I done wrong? He said, don't you, don't you even talk to me. He said, you go up there and sit down. I got orders to catch you as soon as you come in. I walked in Ken Fromm's office, sat down. A few moments he walked in, closed the door, sat down across the desk without a smile on his face, and looked up at me and he said, Chaplain, if I were you, I'd be a little careful about what you saw on yesterday and what you say. Because he said, you see, that information about that oil pool out at Gull Island, and the Gull Island field has just been classified. He said there will be no oil released from it anytime soon. When my book, The Energy Non-Crisis, came out, there was a chapter in there that alluded to Gull Island, the first edition. This is a new updated and enlarged edition. Just after it came out, I had a phone call, maybe two or three months after it came out, from who do you think? Mr. Ken Fromm. The man who was responsible under Atlantic Richfield's leadership 
to develop the entire east side of the Prudhoe Way oil field, I have never heard an oil man so mad in my life. He was beside himself. He said, Lindsay, Atlantic Richfield has just fired me. I said, what? You're a career man. You're the, you're the head person. You, you're the senior executive for the development of the oil field. You produce the cracking plant up there at Prudhoe for all the oil up and down the line. You know more about the Prudhoe Bay oil field than anybody. You came up on the first roller cons that came up years ago. He said, yes, but Atlantic Richfield just fired me. I said, why, Ken? Because he said, they've come to realize that I was the one that allowed you to see the information that you wrote in your book, The Energy and Oil Crisis. Now he said, Lindsay, you're a missionary, a minister. You're not an oil patch man. And he said, there are a few things in your book that are not lutter perfect. He said, would you allow me he said, I'm so angry at Atlantic Richfield. Would you allow me to rewrite your book for you? <laughs> and make everything lutter perfect? I said, Ken, I can't think of anything any better. Because he said, they're going to try to discredit your book on the grounds of a few words that aren't right. For the next 30 days' time, Ken Fromm and I sat across the table from each other and rewrote this book, The Energy and On Crisis, and he added a chapter. The only place on the face of this earth that you will find recorded the largest pool of oil in North America and probably the largest on the face of the earth that our president and our vice president who are oil men know about and will not tell you the facts. The only place on the face of the earth you'll find it documented, written word for word. They've never been able to question it, nor in any way say that it's incorrect, because Ken Fromm himself wrote it. The consistency of the oil, the perforations of the pipe, the depth of the field, the pressure of the field, the, the uh, sulfur content, where it can be refined, it's all right here. The only place you'll find it on the face of the earth. Well, this new updated and enlarged edition came out, thanks to Ken Fromm. About a month or two later, I had another call from him. He said, well, chaplain, I'm glad I helped you rewrite your book. He said, Atlantic Richfield has just hired me back. <laughs> They've given me a large increase of pay. They've promised me a bigger retirement. They're sending me to to Houston to train all the executives that come to Prudhoe Bay from this point on. He said, I won't be able to give you inf any more information. He didn't have to. He'd given me enough. Because if the oil, watch me now, you need to take this to heart because I'm going to make some very drastic statements in a few moments. You think I've said something so far. I haven't said anything that you've ever heard me say before. Because I've only begun giving this in the last six months. I decided I could not keep quiet any longer because your and my freedom is in jeopardy. And unless something is done, America is going to be a has-been. Gasoline at the gas pump, one year from now, here in California, could be less than $1.50 a gallon if the oil that our president and vice president know about on the north slope of Alaska were allowed to come to the refineries in America you know what it cost them to get a barrel of oil, a barrel of oil out of the ground at Prudhoe Bay Alaska do you have the slightest idea what it cost Saudi Arabia to get a barrel of oil out of the ground? Well, I hope you have pencils and paper handy because now I begin with some real nitty gritty. And you may want to jot down some facts and some figures because either things are changed with the administration in Washington, D.C. within the next few months or America will be a has-been. Gasoline at the gas pump 
in California is going to be 4 to $5 a gallon in the very near future. How do I know? Well, what I'm to say from this point on, you will know that I know what I'm talking about. A little boy went to school one morning. He was down south. You know how they talk down there. I'm sure you must recognize that I have a southern accent. The little boy went to school, and the teacher was going around the classroom asking each of the children what they had for breakfast that day. And little Susie spoke up and, you know, show and tell. Little Susie spoke up and said, well, ma'am, I had bacon and eggs this morning. Finally came down to the little Johnny, a little country boy from way back out on the farm. The teacher said, Johnny, what did you have for breakfast this morning? And little Johnny said, well, ma'am, I ate six biscuits for breakfast today. And the teacher said, oh, Johnny, that's not correct English. She said, the word is not it, it's eight. He said, well, maybe it was eight I ate. Now, I'm going to make you a promise. What I have to say from this point on is not going to be a play on words. I'm going to tell it as Paul Harvey says, the rest of the story that you don't hear in the news that only a person who sat in the board meetings with these people, sat across the table from them, rubbed shoulders with them for three years, could have ever known. Things that I have not been willing to tell for the past 15 years for fear of my own safety. I've decided I cannot keep quiet any longer. So I hope you have those pencils and papers handy. In the early 60s, crude oil was chosen as the method of controlling the world. It affects every human being. There's only one thing that affects every human on the face of this earth. The toothbrush that you're going to use to brush your teeth with tonight is made out of plastic. Where does it come from? Crude oil. The plastic bag in the garbage can that you put in your, that you have in your kitchen, it comes from crude oil. The asphalt highway that you drove on in order to get here to this meeting tonight, it came from crude oil. The drugstore, the drugs that you buy, many of them come from crude oil. The shoes that you wear, more than likely they aren't leather, they're probably plastic. It came from crude oil. The polyester clothes that you're wearing, they are a product of crude oil. The price at the grocery store and the hardware store, it's going up because of the price of crude oil. My son and I went to the grocery store the other day. I keep very meticulous records. After all, I have to. Being in the business I'm in, if I didn't, was not a meticulous person, I wouldn't be able to write the books I'd wrote. And I keep records of what I pay at the grocery store for things. When I went to the grocery store the other day, every single item, without exception, had gone up from the previous week. My son and Ed, I had to go over to the hardware store and get an, an item. Daniel was kind of milling around the store in a few moments. He came over to me and he said, Daddy, you know that step ladder you had your eye on the other day that you wanted to buy, but you just didn't quite have the funds to buy it? And I said, yes. He said, you should have bought it. I said, why? He said, it's gone up $19. Now, please write this one down because it carries great weight with what I'm going to say tonight. What we pay at the gas pump is a form of taxation. Now, I, I, this is so important, I'm going to say it again. Very few things I repeat twice. What we pay at the gas pump for a gallon of gasoline is a form of taxation that goes to those who control the world. And before I finish my lecture tonight, I'm going to tell you who they are. You're going to be surprised. Well, I know what you want me to do. You want me to say certain names, don't you? 
Well, instead, I'm going to tell it to you as I lived it. Because you see, what you've read about in other books, not necessarily the truth. You're going to be amazed at who they are. Gas prices at the gas pump in California will be $4 to $5 a gallon at the gas pump in the near, very near future. And Dr. Stan Monteith, a very reputable radio talk show host, said to me on the phone the other day, Lindsay, you're wrong. It's going to be 6 to $7 a gallon, and it wouldn't surprise me one bit that he's not right. And when it happens, your standard of living in America and mine is gone. And it's all done by a design plan that I knew about 25 years ago. And I've tried my best to warn the American people for 25 years. And this may be your last chance to do something about it. Those in Washington are scared to death. They're scared to death to tell you the truth. They don't dare tell you the facts. I'm going to in a few moments. And you take it to them. And you try to tell them yourself if you can. Otherwise, we've had it. Why don't they tell you? Why doesn't President Bush tell you the truth? Why doesn't Mr. Cheney tell you the truth? CEO of Halliburton at one time. He knows it. Why don't they tell you the truth? I'll tell you why. They know what happened to John F. Kennedy when he did. And they shake in their shoes. They know what happened to Larry McDonald on Flight 007 when the powers that be had him destroyed. They know what happened to George Hansen, the man from Idaho who was in the Congress of the United States of America, and they destroyed him, destroyed his family, his home, his position, and after they had totally destroyed him physically and mentally, they patted him on the back and said, Oh, go, George, go on. We can't find a thing wrong that you've done. Every man in Washington knows. Even to some of the congressmen you respect, and they wouldn't dare tell you the truth. But here it is. It'll be on tape tonight. I have it back on the table already taped. There was, back in the 60s or 70s, a gentleman by the name of Henry Kissinger. He was Secretary of State of the United States of America. While he was Secretary of State, he traveled to almost every oil-producing country in the world. He went to Saudi Arabia. After all, the Arabs had been nothing but nomads roaming the deserts riding on camels for many, many years. And he said to them, I'll make you rich. I'd like to cut you a deal. And if you will go along with my deal, I'll see to it that we buy oil from you in America. Watch carefully and you'll understand why that oil from the North Slope of Alaska cannot be allowed to be brought to the refineries of America. Are you ready? Henry Kissinger said, I'll cut you a deal. Oh, they said, what is it? He said, we'll buy oil from you. We'll make you wealthy. You'll be shakes and sheiks. You can have everything you ever wanted. Oh, they said, what's the deal? He said, Number one, you must denominate all oil sales in dollars. Oh, he said, gladly. We have no problem with that. He said, secondly, you can have a certain percentage of that money to build your own company, country, your infrastructure, and the people that are there uh, and to supply for your country, country, but you must take a certain portion of the money that we buy oil from you with, you must take a certain portion of those American dollars and buy our national debt. 
They didn't have the slightest idea what they were doing when they signed on the dotted line. And today, Saudi Arabia and the other oil-producing countries of the world have no choice. They must denominate in American dollars, and they turn around and buy our national debt is the only thing that is keeping the American dollar afloat today. There were two countries that wouldn't sign. You're going to find this very startling. I'm going to give names and dates and places. I, I, I very sell, I, well, I never did this prior to six months ago. I knew it for years. You see, it finally gets to a point that you have one of two choices. Either be a slave in your own land or tell the truth and hope somebody will listen to you. And that's the reason I came here tonight to try to get a listening ear before it's too late. There were two countries that wouldn't sign on the dotted line in the days of Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Number one was Iraq. Saddam. He was too independent. He said, I'm not going to be obligated. The largest oil, known oil field on the face of the earth is Saudi Arabia. Second largest oil field on the face of the earth is Iraq. The third largest oil field on the face of the earth is Iran. I'm going to talk about Iran tonight. You're going to shake in your shoes when you leave from here. I, I'm not pulling any punches with you this evening. It's either now or never. Either something is done now or we are slaves in the very near future. Saddam said, I'm not going to sign on the dotted line. He had to be destroyed. Oh, there are a lot of people in the world just as evil as Saddam. A lot of Russian leaders that have killed more people than Saddam ever did. And yet we joined up with them in the last war. There are a lot of people in the world. Why did Saddam have to be singled out? Because he wouldn't go along. He wouldn't denominate in American dollars and buy our national debt. And President Bush Sr. had no choice but to destroy him. Now there's a name you'll want to jot down. The name is Abna Dethry. D-E-T-H-R-E-Y. I give it to you for one reason and one reason only. He appeared with me on a radio talk show just a few weeks ago. He has never done it before. He worked for the State Department and the CIA and was one of the individuals that was sent by our State Department to Saddam Hussein in February through May of 1990 to tell Saddam Hussein our State Department will not intervene if you invade Kuwait. It was sent by our top officials and echelon to Saddam. We will not. You do remember that prior to the last war that Iraq and Kuwait were one country and Saddam was merely going back in to take back that which had been divided after the last war. And our State Department sent the message by Abner Dethry, who appeared with me on a radio talk show. It is recorded by the talk show host. And he said he took the message to Saddam from our State Department to tell them, we will not invade if you, we will not intervene if you invade Kuwait. It was all a setup by George Bush Sr., because on August the 1st, 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait. It was intentional. Our State Department wanted an excuse to topple Saddam. And they used the invasion which they had told him they would not intervene with so that George Bush Sr. would have an excuse 
to invade him. Saddam was a little too strong for them. George Bush Sr. didn't get elected again. He had to wait eight years. His son got in. He had to finish the job. Surprising. Jot this statement down, if you will, please. The standard currency of the world is oil. Whatever oil is denominated in will determine what the standard currency of the world is. The Federal Reserve note is nothing but a piece of paper. It is not the standard currency of the world. At one time it was solid. You remember it. Back in 1960 you could take one of these into a bank and buy one of these. Can you today? A silver dollar now costs 20 to 25 dollars depending on its quality. That one dollar piece of paper will not buy it anymore. If a rack if we fail, it's not going to be because we don't give them a democracy. Oh, by the way, you do know that we are not a democracy. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. Not democracy. A democracy is we the sheeple. A republic is we the people. They want a democracy given to Iraq because they want control by the oil men of the world. And if they do not succeed, the American dollar is going to be worthless. It's not the fact that we don't win. It's the fact that if they don't succeed, they have big, big problems on their hands. Now they're faced with something else. They're faced with Iran, the third largest oil field on the face of the earth. The Bush-Cheney dynasty is literally milking America for everything it's worth. The powers that be have an agenda. They know what they're doing. I heard them talk about a 30-year plan for the Arabs when I was the chaplain on the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline, and I have watched them carry out their plans meticulously without one single flaw. Now, before I give the next very startling portion of this lecture, I want to give an example. Uh, you'll very readily recognize this, any of you who are 50 and above, you, you'll easily remember back these days. In 1984, I had a phone call one day. It was from Mr. Ken Fromm. He was back with Atlantic Richfield down in Houston. You know, even the powers that be sometimes are a little proud and haughty, have a good time bragging. And he used to call me up on the phone from time to time, and he'd say, well, Lindsay, this, that, and the other. And this time he called me up on the phone, and he said, Lindsay, are you going to be speaking anywhere around America over the next month or two? I said, yes, Ken. In fact, next week I leave to go to Seattle, Washington, and about two or three months later finally wound up in Southern California with speaking engagements. He said, well, Lindsay, I'd like you to tell your audiences everywhere you go something that is going to kind of put your speech on the map. He was bragging, feeling good that day. And I said, Ken, what do you mean? Now, oil at that time was $32 a barrel. We thought it could never go any higher or the world would go broke. And he said, Lindsay, I want you to tell your audiences everywhere you go that crude oil is going to $10 a barrel. I said, Ken, no. 
No, no. I, I, I say that, that can't happen. I said it would break the Arab world. It would break the oil-producing countries of the world. I, I said the people would rise up against their leaders and against their sheikhs and sheikhs. I said, no, that, that can't happen. You, you can't go to $10 a barrel. Ken said very quietly on the phone, Lindsay, come on now. You sat in our board meetings. You know who tells OPEC what we're going to give them for a barrel of oil. He said, Lindsay, you know who's doing this. He said, now come on, take my word for it. It is going to $10 a barrel. By the way, do you know what the price of gold was back at that time? $800 an ounce. You remember it spiked up to that? The powers that be who had made the Arabs and the other oil-producing countries of the world had said to these wealthy sheikhs and sheikhs and others, they'd said, buy gold. No greater investment in the world than gold. They bought it. They bought it by the train car loads. They lined their swimming pools with it. They bought their Rolls Royces and their gold. They had everything they wanted, and they'd paid seven and $800 an ounce for it because they'd been told by the people who I'm going to tell you who they are before I finish my lecture tonight, you're going to be surprised who they are. They'd been told by those people to buy gold, and they did. But you see, it was all a trap. Just like what's happening right now in our economy. Interest-only mortgage on your house, it's a trap. On and on and on I could go, it's a trap. They know what they're doing. Taking interest down to 1%, it was a trap. They told the Arabs, buy all this gold, it was a trap. Ken Fromm said, Lindsay, it's going to $10 a barrel. I began telling that to my audiences as I arrived in Washington State. Sometimes the people in the audience would literally start giggling. <laughs> they thought, you're crazy. You know what you're talking about. When it finally happened that it went to 11 didn't quite go to 10 went to $11 a barrel. When it went to $11 a barrel, I thought my telephone was going to ring off the hook. Everybody said, you're a prophet. I said, no, I'm not a prophet. I just know the people who are doing it. You know what the price of gold went to at the same time that oil went to $10, $11 a barrel? You know what it went to? Remember? Went down to $300 an ounce. Who took it there? Same people that are taking it up right now. Why did they take it there? Because they knew that the oil-producing countries of the world who had signed on the dotted line, whom they had sold their gold to at seven and $800 an ounce, would now have to sell it in order to maintain their economy, and they would have to sell it back to the same people they bought it from for seven and $800 an ounce. They would have to sell it back to them in order to be able to put food on the table in their countries. They'd have to sell it back for $300 an ounce. It was all done by a designed, manipulated, plan, planned in advance, and I knew it six months before it happened, because I'd been told so by the senior executive of Atlantic Richfield, who kind of giggled over the phone and said, Chaplain, come on now. You know who's doing this. Someone said to me a while back, Chaplain Williams, don't you think it's time to brush down the cobwebs and start all over again? I said, no. I think it's time to kill the spider. <laughs> the price of gasoline at the gas pump is a form of taxation imposed by them. Who are they? You want to know who really makes the money that you're paying at the gas pump? Now, this will probably be the most startling thing I'll say tonight. I'm going to prove to you who they are. 
You see, I knew 25 years ago. After all, I sat with them. I listened to them. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. By the providence of God. No other way. Who are they? Let's start the chain. Any product. I care not what it may be. Uh, a flag, a picture, a table, a chair, whatever it may be. There is, first of all, a manufacturer. Then the manufacturer sells it to a wholesaler. Then the wholesaler sells it to an in-between man who sells it to the retailer, and the retailer sells it to you. It's a chain. It, it's true in almost every product. I care not what it is. It's also true in oil. The only thing is, you don't know who the in-between man is because they don't tell you what I'm going to tonight. First of all, there is the oil-producing country of the world, and I'm going to take as an example the one that you recognize and hear most about, Saudi Arabia. They bring it out of the ground. You know what it costs to bring a barrel of crude oil out of the ground in Saudi Arabia? Five dollars. You know what it costs to bring a barrel of crude oil out of the ground at Prudhoe Bay, Alaska? Three dollars. I didn't say transport it. I didn't say refine it. I said bring it out of the ground. It cost Saudi Arabia five dollars, cost the North Slope of Alaska three dollars from our own soil. Why are you paying three dollars at the gas pump recently? Why are you going to pay four and five and six dollars at the gas pump in the very near future? Mark my words, you're going to call me on the phone and say, Lindsay Williams, you are a prophet the night you came to this forum. You mark my words, you will. And I'm going to tell you, no, I tried to warn you. You can't drive these freeways at four and five dollars a gallon and go back and forth to work and put food on your table. You have to depend on the automobile in California, and you'll be taking food off the table to put in the gas tank so you can run it out your exhaust pipe. You mark my words. It's already planned. How do I know? Who gets the profit? First, there's the oil producing country. Then there is someone else that you don't know about. Thirdly, there's the oil company. Oh, all-time record profits. They say, we've never seen them make such profits. That's exactly right. They've never made profits before like they're making right now. They're not making anything compared to what that in-between man makes. And then there's a little service station attendant. Oh, sure, he's happy when it goes to 3 and $4 a gallon. He's making a few more cents per gallon and he just thinks that the world ha has arrived on his, at his house. Who is the person who is making this big in-between amount? I know what you want me to do now. You're expecting me to get ethnic, aren't you? You want me to talk about some family, don't you? I'm not going to do it because I know better. I know who they are. I lived with them for three years. Who are they? I'm going to call them by name. I'm not beating around the bush. I'm just trying to get you prepared for a startling statement that you probably have never heard before. Who are they? Who is this in-between person? They sit behind the computers in New York and London every day and they tell OPEC what they're going to give them for a barrel of oil for that day. They told Ken Fromm they were going to $10 per barrel and he called up this little missionary out there in the bush of Alaska and said, Lindsay, tell people when you go around for your speaking engagements that we're going to $10 a barrel. How did he know it? Because they knew it. They sit behind the computers in New York and London every day and tell every oil producing country in the world what they're going to give them for a barrel of oil for that day and they are the only ones that know what they're going to give them. And they're making exorbitant profits. I'd like to give you an example of one of the profits they're making. 
you heard recently. You, you probably didn't recognize it. You see, the only difference between me and the average person is I know their buzzwords. If you'll listen to the powers that be, you listen to Mr. Greenspan. He tells you the truth. You just don't understand his buzzwords. You listen to the head of Exxon who testified before Congress here just recently. You listen to what he said. You didn't know what he was talking about because you didn't know his buzzwords. He everything but told Congress, get off my back or else. I know what the or else was. Why? Because I lived with them for three years. Who are they? You remember just recently? You heard on the news. I mean, it was all across America. I heard it on the national news. World Bank, IMF, forgive all third world countries their loans. Did they? Did you know what they were talking about? No. You didn't know what they were talking about. I did. Where'd they get the money from to forgive all of those third world countries their loans? You, 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 you. Where'd they get it from? Gas pump. Two dollars and fifty, three dollars a gallon. You've forgotten the days of 25 cents a gallon, haven't you, back in the 60s? Got a very short memory. Well, you're going to have a very good memory when it goes to four and five dollars a gallon in the very near future, and you can't afford to put it in the gas tank any longer. You're going to remember what I've said tonight and wish you had taken more action than what you've been taking. Because you see, they could forgive all of those third world countries their loans. They in turn can see to it that the national debt of the United States of America is financed through the oil producing countries of the world. They can do every bit of it because their representatives sit behind the computers in New York and London every day and tell the oil producing countries of the world what they're going to give them for a barrel of oil for that day and who are they? They're not the oil refineries. You're pointing your finger at the wrong people. And I don't work for them. And I never got one penny of remuneration or salary when I was on the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline. I was paid by my Baptist Mission Board. Alaska Pipeline Service Company never gave me one penny. I am not obligated in any way. You are pointing the finger at the wrong people. The oil companies are making exorbitant profits. Sure they are. But who's making more than they are? The IMF and the World Bank. Who forgave the third world countries their loans? The IMF and the World Bank. How did they do it? You paid it. They diminished our lifestyle in order to give to those countries. Oh, you think for a moment's time that they're not going to make us on the level of a third world country within the next few years? They sure are, because you're going to pay for your own demise at the gas pump. There's only one thing that touches the life of every human being on the face of this earth, and that is crude oil. They chose it as a method of controlling the world in the early 60s, and now the World Bank are the ones that trans every day the transfer of oil from those third world countries to the oil refineries and they're the ones making the exorbitant in between profits and you will never find it out by reading anybody's books and I would have never known it had I not been there and had been told it <coughs> Goldman Sachs predicted that crude oil will reach a hundred and five dollars a barrel who makes the profit? The World Bank and the IMF. By the way, you getting tired? You sure? Nobody going to sleep? All right, I'll, I'll give one more here if you don't mind. Uh, are we running too long? Okay, I, I, I'll put this one in. I didn't give it. Brazil. Brazil went to the World Bank many years ago and said, we'd like to build Brasilia. We want to make a great nation down here in South America. Uh, we need a loan. 
The IMF said, sure. We'll be glad to give you a few billion dollars. But we want some collateral. Oh, Brazil said, fine. We own the, the wealthiest land in the world, the Amazon River Basin. Oh, they said, come on, let us have that as collateral, and we'll be more than happy to give you billions of dollars to build your country. They built Brazilia. They did everything imaginable. Finally, Brazil couldn't quite make it, like none of these other third world countries can too well, except Chavez and a few others. They wouldn't denominate in dollars. And so they said, Brazil comes back and says, oh, we can't even, we, we, we can hardly even make the interest on the payments. The World Bank said, no problem. We'll be glad to give you another line of credit. You know, they, they didn't give them any money. Didn't give them any gold, no silver, diamonds. Brazil had all that. What'd they give them? Computer entry. So the World Bank said, yeah, we'll be glad to give you another computer entry. We'll give you another line of credit. Brazil said, oh, thank you, thank you. Oh, but they said, remember, you gave as collateral the Amazon River Basin. Who owns it today? The World Bank. Brazil doesn't own it. They had to give it to them for another line of credit. Any time the price of a gallon of gas is over $2 a gallon, it went past that a long time ago, at the gas pump, the people who control the world make over $60 billion per year. I hope you'll put that figure down. When crude oil prices increased from $30 to $50 a barrel, the world has to shell out an additional $600 billion a year to the oil-producing countries of the world, who in turn turn around and buy our national debt. Now, what is going to affect your life in the immediate? It's called Iran. It is the third largest oil field in the world. Iran has said that by a certain date, and by the way, that date was given to you tonight by Wendy. I'm not going to repeat it. I will afterwards in questions and answers if you'd like. I have a reason for not giving it right now. I'm being careful what I say tonight. I know this is being recorded. Iran has said by a certain date, we are going to flood the world with cheap oil. They have built their flow line pipes. They have their ports ready. They already have their oil wells drilled. They have the third largest oil field in the world. They have said we are going to flood the oil, the world with cheap oil. And here's the clincher. We are going to denominate all oil sales in euros. Our president and vice president and Congress are shaking in their shoes because they know that if Iran succeeds on the date that they have said that it will collapse the American dollar. Something must be done with Iran before that date. Watch out. A lot of people in the world have a nuclear bomb besides Iran. Why don't they go after them? North Korea, Israel, China. I could go on and on. Why, why don't they take them on? They have to have an excuse. You see, it was weapons of mass destruction. Did they exist? Why are they going to take Iran on now? Oh, you'll hear every reason in the world. There's a reason they won't tell you. They know that if Iran succeeds on the date that they say they're going to, it will collapse the American dollar. Because they'll undercut everybody in the world on oil sales. When President Eisenhower was president of the United States of America, someone came to him one day and they said, President, Smedley Butler is like you. President Eisenhower said, no, 
He had such a great admiration for Major General Smedley Butler, he said, I would like to be like him. Smedley Butler wrote a book. I'm going to give you a quote out of it. War is a racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, surely the most vicious. It is the only one in which the profits are reckoned in dollars and the lives, losses in lives. Only a small inside group knows what it's all about. It is conducted for the benefit of the very few at the expense of the very many. Out of war, few, a few people make huge fortunes. Now, normally authors don't recommend other authors' books. I'm going to do so tonight. His name is John Perkins. You must get his book entitled The Confessions of an Economic Hit Man. It is must reading after what you've heard me say tonight. He says it in a different vein, but he says the same thing. John Perkins, I don't know how he's still alive. John Perkins was an insider. He worked for the powers that be. In his book, he says, economic hitmen are highly paid professionals who cheat countries around the globe out of trillions of dollars. They funnel money from the World Bank and the U.S. Agency for International Development and other foreign aid organizations into the coffers of huge corporations and the pockets of a few wealthy families who control the planet's natural resources. Their tools are fraudulent, financial reports, rigged elections, payoff, extortion, sex, and murder. He should know he did it. And afterwards had such a guilt conscience that he had to write a book even at the cost of his own life. He is still alive. When Mr. Green, now I'm coming down to the closing and the punchline. I'm going to tell you why gasoline cannot be a dollar and fifty cents a gallon at the gas pump. I'm going to tell you why they cannot allow the Gull Island oil pool to ever come to the American people. But I've got to lead up to it with this. And with that, I'm going to close. Mr. Greenspan, Federal Reserve Chairman, when he began his tenure in office, the American debt was $1.5 trillion. Today, the debt in the United States of America, oh, and we say he's done such a marvelous job with our economy. Today, the debt is $8 trillion plus. In the month of September, go back, by the way, in your computer. You'll be able to look this up for yourself. The U.S. Treasury Bureau of Public Debt website uh, on one day in the month of September, recorded that the national debt went up $60.1 billion in one day. You can find that on your website. It was published. Our President administration, last, uh, in the month of October, the Bush administration ran up a national debt of $94.4 billion in one month. OPEC oil producers are at maximum output. Saudi Arabia can't produce any more until they dig some more wells and put in some more flow line pipes. Every oil refinery in America is operating at 90 plus capacity. No new oil refineries have been built in the United States of America for over 20 years and it's done by a design plan. The U.S. is importing 400 thousand gallons of gasoline a day from other countries. The U.S. had 321 refineries in 1981. The U.S. only has 149 refineries today. Many plants are operating 24 hours a day with no town downtime for maintenance to supply the growing demand. We are operating at 90 plus output capacity and the least little bobble and the gasoline stations would have up signs, no gas available. Now, here is the rest of the story. President Bush cannot allow oil from the North Slope of Alaska to come to the United States of America. Because if he did, 
the oil-producing countries of the world who signed on the dotted line in the days of Henry Kissinger would not be obligated to take a certain portion of everything that we give them in payment for oil and turn around and buy our national debt. And the pork in Washington, D.C., and the $8 trillion debt would collapse the American economy and the American dollar. Therefore, our administration today cannot afford to allow you to get the oil from Gull Island Pool because if they did and brought it out of the ground at $3 a barrel and allowed American refineries to refine it, gasoline at the gas pump within one year's time could come down to a dollar and fifty cents a gallon or less. But Bush and the others in Washington know it would collapse our economy if they did it. And they cannot tell you the truth. Somebody must buy our national debt. Many others are besides just the oil-producing countries, but they alone would cause our dollar to collapse. Mark my words. You will be paying 4 to $5 a gallon at the gas pump in the very near future. Why? You will be paying the national debt through the gas pump. You will be paying the third world country's loans at the gas pump, taking it off of the table where your children need food by a design plan, which I knew about 25 years ago, and begged the American people to listen. Have you ever wondered what happened to the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence? Five signers were captured by the British as traitors and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons in the Revolutionary Army. Another had two sons captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds and hardships of the Revolutionary War. They signed and they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. What kind of men were they? Twenty-four were lawyers or jurists. Eleven were merchants. Nine were farmers and large plantation owners. Men of means, well-educated. But they signed the Declaration of Independence knowing fully well that the penalty would be death if they were captured. Carter Baxter of Virginia, a wealthy planter and trader, saw his ship swept from the seas by the British Navy. He sold his home and properties to pay his debts and died in rags. Thomas McKean was so hounded by the British that he was forced to move his family almost constantly. He served in Congress without pay, and his family was kept in hiding. His possessions were taken from him, and poverty was his reward. Vandals and soldiers, or both, looted the properties of Ellery, Clymer, Hall, Walton, Gwinnett, Haywood, Rutledge, and Middleton at the Battle of Yorktown. Thomas Nelson, Jr. noticed that the British General Cornwallis had taken over the Nelson home for his headquarters. The owner quietly urged George Washington to open fire. The home was destroyed and Nelson died bankrupt. Francis Lewis had his home and properties destroyed. The enemies jailed his wife, and he died within a few months. John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside as she was dying. Their 13 children fled for their lives. His fields and grits mills were laid waste. For more than a year, he wandered in forests and lived in caves, returning home to find his wife dead and his children vanished. Within a few weeks' time, he died of exhaustion and a broken heart. Norris and Livingston suffered similar fates. Such were the stories and the sacrifices of the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence. They were not wild-eyed, rabid, rousing ruffins. They were soft-spoken men of means and education. They had security, but they valued liberty more. 
Standing tall and straight and unwavering, they pledged for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And gave to you and you and my son here and me the privilege of a free land and to be in assembling tonight as free people. <laughs>